Let's talk about viewfinders today. Not any type of viewfinder, but hybrid viewfinders. This video is a bit longer, so quick overview. We're going to discuss some basic optical ray diagrams, the history of viewfinders, and finally going to build our own hybrid finder. But let's start at the start. If you have owned an even moderately fancy camera in the past, it's pretty likely that you have already looked through an optical viewfinder. But why use one today if your camera got a display with a live image? Well, there are still a few advantages other than pure nostalgia, so the good old glass and metal viewfinders made their comeback as electronic viewfinders. That these tiny displays with some lenses to give you the impression of a really large display right in front of your eye. And they are quite okay. But one company did something weird a few years ago. Fujifilm released the X100, and it was more or less a standard retro-style camera with a fixed lens. It was marketed as a travel camera, but probably targeted at fancy vintage hipsters and nostalgic baby boomers. So nothing that exciting, I guess. Except for one small thing. It was neither a rangefinder camera nor a camera with an electronic viewfinder, but kind of both. Fujifilm called it the hybrid viewfinder, and it was basically a standard optical viewfinder, but you could either use an electronic overlay or flip a switch to close a window and actually use it as a regular viewfinder display. All things considered, if you've got a camera with a fixed lens, it's the best of both worlds. It did work really well, I had one back then and I loved it. The idea is so nice that I feel obliged to steal it. So. We're going to build our own hybrid viewfinder today. But before we do that, let me put a tiny disclaimer here. I spent most of my rather low quality physics classes daydreaming and had very little clue about optical systems before I started this. I did miss out on a few basic concepts and I had to look these up and that may be true for a lot of other people as well. So let's take the time and talk shortly about ray diagrams so we can discuss different viewfinder designs later on. If you would rather jump to the historical overview of viewfinders or to the point where we make our own, this video has chapters. But all the ray diagrams have been kind of a pet peeve of mine after struggling with them, and I think they are a major obstacle to understanding optical systems for a lot of people. Let's assume we got a light source sitting somewhere at quite a distance from us. Technically, we could say it's infinitely far away. The light emitted from the light source is a spherical wave. We don't care in particular about the fact that it's a wave, but the spherical part is important. Since we are an observer with a camera or an eye, we only need to care about the segment of the spherical wave that makes its way into our optical system. We just pretend that all of the light that does not hit our eye's pupil or our camera's lens does not exist. And given the distance, the light beam is basically straight and parallel, so it's collimated when it hits us. The lens in the camera then focuses this pencil-shaped beam into a spot on the sensor, and we see a bright point. When we put a light next to the first one, we get the same collimated beam coming in, but at an angle, and it's getting focused on a point higher or lower on the sensor. So. Here starts my problem, because I never got that while sitting in the last row in my physics classes. When a high school teacher wants to explain that stuff, usually the wave is substituted by one or more rays. Simply because it's easier to think of light as a photon traveling along a straight line, and it kind of makes sense. But one or several of these rays in combination describe one or several aspects of how the optical system behaves. So sometimes this pencil-shaped beam is substituted by a single ray. Sometimes it is substituted by a bundle of rays. Sometimes only the minimum and maximum rays are actually drawn. Sometimes there is a single light source sending out collimated rays, and sometimes there is an object sending out light from infinitely many points forming an image. So, looking at the selection of rays you see might either tell you that the light is collimated or focused or they might tell you the field of view, or where the image is in focus, or if it is flipped, or the magnification ratio, or all of that at the same time. 
If you have the context or already know enough about optics to get which aspect of the system is depicted by the rays, it's easy. If you want to look at ray diagrams to get started, it's not. So that's kind of horrible. Of course, one needs to simplify things to build a mental model that is sufficient and easy to understand for the problem at hand. Most high school kids don't want to hear something about electromagnetic waves and Maxwell's equations and light fields first. Thin rays are easy to draw with chalk on a blackboard and allow geometrical ray tracing and so on. I know. But if you've got multiple conflicting simplifications, it just gets a mess. And it's not a good tool to convey this initial rough concept. Anyway, in our case, and for the sake of simplicity, we can think about light as thick pencil-shaped rays that are as wide as our optical system can handle. Instead of drawing two maximum and minimum rays, we draw one thick one. Later on, we'll shoot one ray along the optical axis and another one from a second light source. The second one will be at the highest or lowest angle that still makes it into the lens, but we'll use it only if necessary. The first one tells us what the optical system is doing to our light in general, and the second one tells us something about the field of view. That's only marginally better than standard ray diagrams, but the only way to make it really simple is fancy animation, and I'm way too lazy for that. Luckily, viewfinders are rather simple and a few basic rules apply. We can always assume that the object that is emitting the light is infinitely far away, thus the incoming light is collimated. The light exiting the viewfinder needs to be roughly collimated as well, because our eye does the focusing. And the eye needs a bit of distance to the last piece of glass, otherwise it gets really uncomfortable, or the 50% of the population wearing glasses are not happy. That's called eye relief. One last thing before this long winding intro is done. Lenses. Basically, there are a lot of lens shapes, but only two types are important for us. Converging lenses collect light and focus it on a point that lies in the same direction as the light travels. So the focal length is positive. Diverging lenses let light diverge, so it seems to originate from a virtual focal point on the back side of the lens. They have a negative focal length. So, that's the boring prerequisites. Now the fun part. Let's look at the evolution of viewfinders. Very early large format cameras used ground glasses and no viewfinder at all. In the place of the film holder there was a, well, ground piece of glass that diffused the focused light. So you could use it as a see-through projection screen. It has a few advantages, basically what you see is what you get, at least more or less, but the image was very dark, mirrored in both axes, and it enforced a very static style of taking images. Much quicker was the very first viewfinder for handheld cameras, and it was a bare minimum. A sports viewfinder. You may know these Second World War era reporter style cameras, the Graphlex Speed Graphic. The photographer needs to line up a hole and a wireframe, or two wireframes, and gets a rough estimate of the direction and field of view. If you want to make one yourself, that's pretty easy and straightforward with a 3D printer. The downside is that it can't show a field of view wider than the human eye. But even today, there might be situations where a sports viewfinder is useful. Let's look at the surprisingly fashionable diving camera ad from 1986, for example. Improving on the field of view problem is a Newton or Newtonian viewfinder, also referred to as a hybrid viewfinder. But that's not the type of hybrid we want to build here. It was a single negative lens that lets light diverge when it travels through it. When we follow the ray backwards in our diagram, we see the focal point in front of the lens. To use a viewfinder, you need to keep a minimum distance so the eye is able to refract the light enough to get it to focus on the retina. That's not very comfortable, and over the years we gradually lose our ability to squeeze the lens in our eyes. So these viewfinders were harder to use for old people. The big advantage? They make the world look smaller, so they work with wide-angle lenses. On the images, you can see frame lines on the glass and the signpost. That helps to center the eye and get the correct framing. 
Let's move on to the first viewfinder as we know it and still use it today. The Newtonian is slightly uncomfortable to use. So what happens if we add another positive lens to counteract the diverging effect of the negative lens? We just need to align both focal points for that. The light enters and exits collimated. Perfect. But what happens if we shoot a second ray at an angle? We can see that the image on the retina becomes smaller, so we have a larger field of view through the viewfinder than through our bare eye. If we would flip it, the viewfinder would still work, but objects would look larger on the retina. That's also known as a Galilean telescope, so it makes sense that the viewfinder is called a reverse Galilean. The big advantage is that it's pretty simple. Two lenses, nothing else. The disadvantage, two lenses, nothing else. The only point where you could place frame lines in this optical system is at the focal point of the positive lens, several centimeters in front of the viewfinder, and that's not really an option. But the Galilean still has its uses today. I got a cheap disposable camera here. Let's open it up and see what's hiding in there. Quick note, discharge the capacitor of the flash. It hurts if you don't. So what do we have here? Two injection molded clear plastic parts, one negative, one positive. It's a Galilean. But how do we get frame lines or other overlays in our image? I'm going to skip a few different viewfinder designs in the meantime and talk only about two concepts still relevant today. One of those is the Albada viewfinder. Let's keep our Galilean viewfinder, but try to put the focal point somewhere inside the viewfinder assembly. That's what Van Albada did in the 1930s. Deposit a bit of silver on the curved surface of the negative lens, not enough to make it a regular mirror, but enough to reflect some light. The rest of the light will still pass through it. We'll talk a bit more about this later. Now we put some white paint or translucent cellophane paper around the positive lens on the inside of the viewfinder housing, just like you see here. The focused image of these frame lines is then reflected by the mirror and collimated by the positive lens. When it hits the eye, it looks like an overlaid image. Pretty clever. Okay, last one. The problem of the Albada viewfinder is that the curvature of the negative lens is both used for refracting light and for reflecting it. That's a bit of unnecessary complexity. Can we, maybe, split the refracting and the reflecting parts of this concept? Sure, and that's a bright frame viewfinder. Instead of depositing a tiny amount of reflective silver on the curved lens surface, we can do that with a flat piece of glass in between positive and negative lens. If we just add enough metal to get the surface to 50% reflection, we can create a beam splitter. Half of the light travels unobstructed through the silver coating, almost like a window. Half of the light gets reflected in a 90 degree angle. If that sounds vaguely familiar, that's exactly how teleprompters work, or the famous Pepper's Ghost illusion. In a second step, we can use light from the environment, which hits a diffuser window with frame lines on the inside. This light is reflected by a regular mirror and the beam splitter mirror into the positive lens. That's kinda nifty because it allows us to have a much simpler viewfinder design, but it takes up a bit more space. But maybe you want to add additional things to the optical path anyway. That would be the point where we would venture into rangefinder designs. These are the most technically complex viewfinders because they got frame lines and mechanically coupled focusing indicators. Some even got a parallax correction for subjects close to the camera and so on. If you ever wanted to know why some cameras have this whitish window next to the viewfinder, now you know. But I'm not going to talk about those, because actually, this video is about something else. Let's start simple. How can we build our own viewfinder without fancy frame lines? So of course, which lenses do we need and where do we get them? Basically, whenever choosing lenses, we got two basic options. Lenses with one flat surface and one curved surface, called plano-convex or plano-concave, or lenses that have the same or different curvatures on both sides, b-concave or b-convex lenses. In addition to that, there are surfaces which have a spherical curvature, easy to calculate, easy to manufacture, 
and aspherical curvatures, which are described by an equation. Harder to calculate, harder to manufacture. We'll go with a plano concave and a plano convex spherical lens that's cheaper and easier for us. In general, when doing optical design, people start with thin lenses and paraxial equations. That means that each lens is an infinitely thin surface and the refraction of light obeys a very simple formula. At least when it's close to the optical axis. And usually that's good enough for the rough design. For a Galilean viewfinder, that means that the magnification is the focal length of the first lens divided by the focal length of the second one. And the distance between both lenses is simply the difference in focal length. Since I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of custom lenses, we stick with off-the-shelf parts we can buy from a lens manufacturer. Edmund Optics, for example, is pretty convenient. By picking something from the catalog, we make our life a lot easier. Because once we decided on the two required lenses, we just need to find the right distance between them. So it's less options and less variables to optimize for. In this case, we'll do it as simple as possible. We want a magnification of about 0.5, so the field of view that our eyes give us would be about 20 to 25 mm. The negative lens is a minus 30 mm lens with 20 mm diameter. The positive lens is a 60 mm lens with 20 mm diameter as well. Using the thin lens approximation, the distance would be 30 mm. And that's important for the hybrid viewfinder later on. But how do we get the precise distance between both real lenses? We can calculate that using the back and front focal distances from the datasheets that Edmund Optics is publishing for the lenses. Or we can just crunch the numbers with software. I did this in this case with ZMAX Optic Studio, importing the lenses from the built-in lens catalog. For this particular problem, that's surely a bit overkill, but it will save us a bit of hassle later on. These Optic Studio diagrams, however, are not exactly easy to read, so let's redraw them for this video. Usually when designing things, the convention dictates that light travels from left to right through the optical system, and on the right is the eye or the sensor. But for eyepieces, it is apparently not uncommon to flip that around. So we are just defining a light source with parallel rays, about the size of a human eye's pupil and shoots the light into the viewfinder. That's what I did here. So imagine the eye is placed on the left side, looking at a far away object to the right. The software is generating two sets of rays for testing, blue and green here. These colors are just to identify the ray bundles. They are not indicating wavelength. Blue are all collimated rays that go right through the center. Green are the rays that are as angled as possible to still go through the system. Optic Studio can now optimize a single variable in the system. The distance between both lenses so that the rays on the right exiting the negative lens are as collimated as possible. The calculated distance of 27.964 mm is all we need. Let's do a quick test. We just need to 3D print an enclosure and see if everything just works. Usually not, but in this case it actually did. Reproducing a very basic viewfinder, check. Next step, add a digital overlay. So how can we add a second image in general? Remember the trick of the bright frame viewfinder and adding frame lines at an appropriate distance to actually be in focus? How do we do that? We can basically just use this design, but we need to change two things. Apparently, when doing a course on optics, there is some chapter about the Swiss knife of optical engineering, the magical tool that is also known as a prism. Prisms can be used and abused for numerous purposes, from analyzing wavelength, flipping images along different axes, to micro-adjusting angles and distances, and beam splitting. Prisms are everywhere. That's a rangefinder of the Leica M3. And these are all the prisms. Each one has a different job. But we need a beam splitter. And instead of using a thin half silvered mirror, which is just a straight piece of glass, we can also use a prism with a 45 degree angle and put the coating on the long side. On the top of that, we can save ourselves a bit of hassle and just put two prisms together along the angled faces to get a beam splitter cube. 
That's a lot easier to place and align at exactly the right position. When we look at Fujifilm's long gun product page in the Wayback machine, we see exactly that was done for the X100's hybrid viewfinder. Thanks marketing people. I'm not trying to be sarcastic here. The old product page has a lot of surprisingly in-depth info about the X100's development process. And I do greatly appreciate these type of product stories. There's even a diagram showing the type of lenses. Okay, back to the beam splitter. The issue is that the beam splitter cubes are annoyingly expensive when purchased at Edmund Optics. But unlike the lenses, it is quite easy to get a cheap one from China via AliExpress. Nice, we saved there about 90% of the price. Remember the empty space we left between the lenses earlier? There we can now easily fit our beam splitter cube. Once we do that in Optic Studio, we see that the distances need to change slightly to account for the refraction of the cube surfaces, but the software handles that for us. The last remaining problem is how to actually create the overlay. The bright frame viewfinder uses physical frame lines, but we need to replace these with a display to get a digital overlay. Before we do that, let's talk about our optical system again for a moment. Keep in mind how the Galilean viewfinder works. Light enters in parallel rays and exits in parallel rays as well. When using the viewfinder, the eye focuses on infinity to get a sharp image on the retina. If the light exiting the viewfinder is not perfectly parallel, the lens in our eye can compensate for that. That's what you see in a lot of really cheap Galilean viewfinders. The plastic lenses can't refract the light enough to achieve a truly collimated light beam, so the eye needs to add to that. After using it for a few minutes, you can actually feel the strain, but it still works fine. When we want to overlay an image from a display, the light emitted by the display needs to be exactly as parallel as the viewfinder's light, since our eye can't focus them independently. Can we do that? Sure. Probably there is a clever way to model both optical paths in a single system with Optic Studio, but for me it was way simpler to model them in two different projects. The first optical system is a viewfinder as we know it, just with the beam splitter cube added in between the lenses. For this purpose, the beam splitter is just a cube of glass. In the second optical system, the path from display to eye involves just the beam splitter and the positive lens close to the eye, not the negative lens towards the front. The positive lens has a focal point about 60 mm in front of the lens. So if you place some point light source, such as pixels of a display, exactly at the focal point, the light rays exiting the lens would be parallel, basically like a magnifying lens. As a display, I'm not using a tiny higher resolution display as the X100 is doing it, but the most convenient display I had within reach, a smartphone display. That means that we need a second prism to reflect the light by 90 degrees again, so we can place a viewfinder on top of the phone. That second mirror prism is a simple glass prism without a mirror coating, since the glass itself will reflect internally at this angle. So that's it, we got our viewfinder. Optic Studio does a hard job of calculating these four distances in between the lenses and prisms, and we're done. When designing an enclosure for the optical components, I don't care much about micrometer adjustability of the components. I'm just gonna 3D print it, so there is a limit to precision anyway. If distances and angles are a bit off, we'll get some aberrations and the view might be slightly less sharp, but that's simply something we need to accept. The lenses are just a press fit, since I absolutely want to avoid using fancy fixtures or glue. Just a bit of super glue already creates enough vapor to permanently blur any glass surface in the vicinity. So let's see if it works. Indeed. That's how it looks, a hybrid viewfinder for your smartphone. To actually use it, you need to put an image on the small display area that gets picked up by the prisms. So I wrote a quick and dirty Android app for testing. I'm using it to show a spirit level right now, but a histogram or some additional info might make sense as well. It may look slightly silly when you're using it, but it works surprisingly well. The magnification ratio of 0.5 works nicely here, because when looking through the finder, the 50mm focal length of the human eye becomes 25mm, 
and that more or less matches a 24mm lens of the phone. In case you're wondering about this mysterious blob on the front camera, you may recognize the shape from the last video on soft lenses I did. But the story of the blob is something for one of the next videos. Let's talk about the problems before we are done. The optical path of the light emitted by the display involves only the positive lens and the prisms, nothing else. On the page of the X100 we see another negative lens and a doublet. And when we look at our digital overlay we see why. There is quite some distortion and chromatic aberration because we don't have any additional lenses to cancel out these errors. Another issue is that the pixel density of the smartphone is high but not crazy high. I'm using the LG G6 here with about 560 ppi and that's totally okay for your bare eye. But the lenses and prisms are rather small and the actual size of the segment of the display that is overlaid is just 370 by 370 pixels. For comparison the electronic viewfinder from my camera has three and a half times more pixels. That makes the overlay a bit blocky and pixelated. There may be a clever way to capture a larger section of the display, but for now that should suffice. And we're coming to an end. I hope you enjoyed learning about the evolution of the camera viewfinder as much as I did. You can find a bit of additional info in the blog post linked in the description. If you want to build something similar, I listed the lenses and Edmund Optics part numbers there as well. Before I finish this video, most info about historical viewfinders in this video is based on an excellent compilation by Rick Olson. I can highly recommend reading his whole article because I barely scratched the surface of what you will find there. That's it. Have fun and build something.